that's that's I think a feature which which uh, I would like to highlight here. So I think now the the, the best is to hear the master of STM, Shimus. Thank you very much for coming here. All right. Okay. So can everyone hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. All right. So it's an honor and a privilege for me to be here. I missed an earlier invitation for which I sincerely apologize. The uh, U.S. government is not very stable and there are powerful fluctuations which affect all of us very much. But at the moment it's in operation so I'm free to travel. Um, much of the work I'll talk about today is funded by Brookhaven National Lab. Um, and physically, most of it is actually carried out at Cornell University, but some at St. Andrews University in Scotland as well. And I'm going to tell you about high temperature superconductivity. And in fact, it isn't the same old story that I'm going to tell you of how horribly difficult the problem is and how after decades of struggle we have made few advances. In fact, it's the opposite story. In the last few years, um, very rapid advances have been made in dealing with this problem so that now um, I think we're very close to solving it within a reasonably short time. Now, especially for students and postdocs in the audience, um, I want to introduce you to Cornell University. It's in a very remote location. It's about 250 miles from New York City, way out in the countryside. The only thing of interest here are great universities, wineries, and deer. Uh, <laughs> but it's a wonderful place to work. It has one of the best traditions in the United States of low temperature physics. And it was a joy for me to move there. Um, and now we have an extremely active and young department in the physics department at Cornell University. If anyone would like to contact me, I would be delighted to answer any questions or let you know anything about this wonderful place. And we are always on the lookout for uh, superb graduate students, superb postdocs, superb assistant professors, superb professors, superb being the key word here. <laughs> If you're interested in going to Cornell, let me know. Another thing, I'm not sure if this is the correct tradition or not, but I go very fast through a lot of complex material. And it will be easier, I believe, for you to stop me and ask me a question than to wait till the end. You probably won't even remember the point <laughs> uh, at which the question occurred. So just put up your hand and ask me to stop. So very quickly, I'm going to tell you, actually, I need to turn down the lights now. Let's see. Wrong way. No. Which one? Oh. Right. Yeah. So very quickly, I'm going to, going to tell you about the history of superconductivity. <coughs> then I'll tell you about the technique that we primarily use, which has been turned out to be critically important for understanding the very complex electronic matter in high temperature superconductors. And then quickly I'm going to survey the things we know as of today having to do with the copper based high temperature superconductors and their coexisting phases, the iron based high temperature superconductors and their coexisting phases, and the heavy fermion superconductors and possibly their coexisting phases. And right at the end I want to introduce you to a sequence of new ideas which allow us to have a general model for how all of these things, the different phases, the different order parameters, go together even though the, the families of materials are very different, we can find a quite simple explanation to capture them all in one simple theory. And this is brand new. This paper only appeared uh, on Monday of last week, so this is quite up to date. So here's Kammerlingonis. I just came from um, Delft in uh, Holland and they, they were mad at me because I misspelled his name. But in any case, he did discover <laughs> superconductivity just over 100 years ago. Perfectly dissipationless electrical and electronic phenomena. 
Um, our classical picture of superconductivity, as many of you know, is you have a, a band, a band structure of electrons in a crystal. Here are the Brion zone faces. The states are filled up to some level, which we call the Fermi level. The Fermi energy and the Fermi momentum are set. In a three-dimensional wave vector space, you can think of this as a, whoops, you have your other pointer. Yeah, no? Okay, it's okay, I'll keep going. Ah, thank you. This guy's going to fail. There it goes. Great. Shall we put the, the other No, the I, ne I need this one, yeah. Okay. Let's see. Good. So in a three-dimensional momentum space, all the uh, low, uh, long wavelength, low wave vector states are filled up to the Fermi energy. <coughs> So this state um, then undergoes a transition where electrons of opposite spin and opposite momentum are bound in a new quantum mechanical state, a Cooper pair, and a superfluid of these Cooper pairs is formed, that's the BCS superconducting state, and there's a pair energy gap, okay, which is the energy required to break the Cooper pair and release one of the Bogolubov quasiparticles. And this gap appears particle hole symmetric at the chemical potential. So here's where the Fermi <laughs> energy was and the gap opens at that point. Um, this, the structure of this superconducting energy gap is very important in the theory of superconductivity. This is the BCS self-consistent gap equation. If there's an interaction potential between two electrons, V, then if you put that potential in this self-consistent equation, energy gap is minus sum of V energy gap and uh, dispersion of the quasiparticles. If you can solve that equation for a given material and a given interaction potential, then you can get a superconductor. If you can solve it for a very strong interaction, you can get a very strong superconductor. The really interesting thing that, to notice about this equation is that in the conventional state, this interaction is attractive, so this is a negative number. So minus times minus gives plus, and then a simple function here, an isotropic function, will solve this equation. That's how conventional S-wave superconductors work. But there's a much, and the interaction which binds those Cooper pairs together is the electron lattice interaction in the crystal, which is actually a very weak interaction. Of course, there can be very, very strong interactions between electrons. Let's say the Coulomb interaction. The Coulomb interaction separating two electrons and two adjacent atoms could be many electron volts. But the Coulomb interaction is repulsive. So you would think, okay, if this is a positive number, there's no way to solve this equation. But that's not true. In quantum mechanics, this function and this function could change sign in momentum space such that there's still a solution for this equation even though this is a very strong positive interaction. And that's the reason why it's plausible to imagine that strongly interacting electrons could still produce robust Cooper pairs and room temperature superconductivity. So here's the, hist here's the critical temperature versus year of conventional superconductors. And you'll see for most of a century, it went up as, at, at the rate of a fraction of one Kelvin per year. And at that rate, it would have taken uh, until the year 3500 to reach room temperature superconductivity. <laughs> now, the young people in the audience may feel like they could wait till then, but I certainly can't. So uh, this was a disheartening piece of information. And the interaction making these superconductors is the electron lattice interaction. Starting in 1987, the copper-based high temperature superconductors appeared. And then 2008, the iron-based high temperature superconductors appeared. And they really change our perception of what's possible. It looks like one could plausibly have room temperature superconductivity. Don't forget, room temperature is arbitrary. It's just some number which happens to be a number at which we can survive, but in terms of electron-electron interactions, it's arbitrary. From what's going on in these compounds, there appears to be no reason to imagine that room temperature superconductivity is impossible or is even very far away in time. Um, 
Now, if we had room temperature superconductivity, uh, it would revolutionize large parts um, of the electrical and electronic basis of our society and our science. Uh, we could have much uh, more efficient and stable power networks. You have a relatively stable power network here in Spain, but in the United States, in North America, the power network is very unstable um, and it needs to be replaced. It would be nice to replace it with a superconducting power network. A very big problem in many parts of the world is that more people are moving back into the city centers as suburban life and all the carbon footprint of using a car every day becomes a huge negative. A big problem with that though is it's very difficult to deliver enough power at the density of people who are living in cities now. And by 2050 there will be no way using traditional electrical engineering to deliver enough power to the core of a city. There will be too many people there and they'll be using too many kilowatts per person. The best way we can think of at the moment to do it would be to pull out the copper cables and replace them with high current superconducting cables. Then there would be no difficulty to power the big cities. We need to accommodate renewable power. Um, it'll come from sunlight here in Spain and it comes from uh, ocean waves and the wind in Ireland. But wherever it comes from, we can't build a high voltage power line for every renewable power source. There has to be a low voltage, cheap and efficient way to bring the power from all those sources. Superconducting cables could do that. I have information technology right here at the middle of my slide because it is actually the fastest growing part of the energy usage of everyone in the world, including all of you. The reason why Google can answer your question before you finish typing is that they have literally hundreds of millions of computers you know, working to answer those questions for you. But those computer farms uh, require a tremendous amount of energy and the rate of growth of energy use is uh, more for this application than any other application. Superconducting computers would be, would be a fantastic way to solve this problem. High energy physics needs some new ideas and one of them is uh, uh, resonant superconducting linear accelerators. They're much more compact than these giant rings. Um, also, they need higher magnetic fields if they're going to keep using the rings for medicine and for transport and also for military reasons. There are many potential applications for um, uh, room temperature superconductivity. Now, here is the question we face. It's clear uh, for many reasons that whatever is making these robust Cooper pairs here cannot be the electron lattice interaction. It's got to be some other interaction which is strong enough to make Cooper pairs which can remain bound, let's say, at room temperature or above. One quantum mechanical phenomenon which survives well above room temperature is, of course, magnetism. And there's an a priori reason to suspect that antiferromagnetism is the key to this correlated high temperature superconductivity. Um, if we go back in time, originally in the late 70s it was found that when antiferromagnetism is suppressed in heavy fermion superconductors, uh, the superconductivity appears. Then in the late 80s, Alex Muller found that when antiferromagnetism is suppressed in the cube rates, superconductivity appears. Hosono-san found just 10 years ago that when antiferromagnetism is suppressed in the iron superconductors, superconductivity appears. There's a a priori reason to ask whether we can find a direct link between anti strong antiferromagnetism and correlated superconductivity. And if we can find and understand that link, we'd like to use our knowledge to develop new and better superconductors. But amazingly, it's not clear yet whether this link exists. So at least for my own motivation for the last 10 years or so, I've been really trying to pursue this link and see if there's a way of demonstrating that it is the correct explanation. Okay, now I want to tell you about how we do visualization of electronic structure. This is a lot of fun. Um, Originally, when I built my first one of these machines, I wanted to image a D-wave vortex core. So many of you here in the audience are familiar with the challenge of imaging vortex cores, and uh, that was also my motivation. Um, here's a STM, beautiful machine. You can go down in the basement and see many of them in operation. They're very good at seeing where the atoms are. 
Um, typically, a commercial STM can only image the atomic locations. Those are bismuth atoms, um, those are calcium atoms, these are strontium atoms, these are uranium atoms. To image the electronic matter waves, we use uh, the technique where we stop the tip at every location and measure the differential tunneling conductance, di, dv, as a function of the bias voltage between the tip and the sample. That function is proportional to the density of states. So here's the surface of high TC superconductor BISCO. Um, there's about 30,000 atoms resolved in that field of view. And then we stop the tip at the first atom, measure the differential conductance, and the second atom, and the third atom, and so on, and so on, and so on. And at the end of that process, we can get an image of the differential conductance in the same field of view at a certain energy, let's say 50 millivolts. But we can get that image then um, at all energies, so that we can make a movie of the electronic structure. And the simplest way to think of this movie is as an image of a psi squared of the wave functions of the material uh, resolved by energy. So you're seeing the wave functions at each different energy all in the same field of view. Here's the chemical potential, now we're going into the field states, here we see the wave functions and so on. It's an interesting fact that when we, uh, and Hermann knows this well, when we first introduced the, this application, the referees really were not capable of dealing with the data because human beings find it hard to believe that um, an infinite number of different phenomena can occur at the same region of space. But in quantum mechanics, that's no problem. At each energy, you can have a different wave function than at every other energy. So there's no difficulty to make, to look at the same region of space and see all kinds of different phenomena at different energies. And it took a while to educate the audience to realize that that is exactly what you should expect. Okay, so we, the simplest way to think of this as atomically resolved, energy resolved image of the wave functions. <coughs> Now to get, one of, to get one of these images here is tough. Many of you work on doing these images in the beautiful STMs uh, here at UAM. To get this whole movie in a reasonable time is really quite challenging. When you put in the numbers, you have to stabilize the vibrations of the tip relative to the surface to about one femtometer at each location. You're not doing that to improve your signal, you're not doing that to improve your spatial resolution, you're, in, you're doing it to suppress the random current noise which comes from the changing distance between the tip and the surface. So you have to suppress those distance fluctuations into the femtometer range and you have to do it everywhere in this field of view in order to get one of these movies in let's say a fraction of a day. Um, and in fact it was widely believed that this was extremely difficult if not impossible to do and luckily for me, I didn't know anything about STM research, so I just decided to do it. <laughs> so uh, the scheme I came up with was one where you suppress the vibrations in the laboratory into the femtometer range. So how do we do that? So here's a, a low vibration cryostat. It's like the ones you would see in the basement here um, in Hermann's group, except the cryostat is not in the hole in the ground. It's supported by a vibration isolation table, but otherwise not too different. And then this vibration isolation table is inside an acoustic isolation room, like a sound recording studio, which is sitting on the foundation, which is sitting on the floor, but the floor is not touching the foundation. It's sitting on vibration isolation springs. So this is like a giant 40 ton laser table, if you're familiar with laser tables. And then this assembly is embedded in an underground reinforced concrete uh, isolation chamber. So this is really a Russian doll design. You just keep suppressing the vibrations until they're gone. The last step is to cool the STM from room temperature down to sub-Kelvin temperatures to get rid of KT. So here we have micron vibrations, here we have a few tens of nanometers, the floor of our room is a few angstroms, the table is moving only a few picometers at room temperature, and then by the time we cool down below one Kelvin, the STM tip is moving only a few femtometers. And that's so stable and so quiet that we usually keep the same experimental field of view um, 
oftentimes for years, because at those temperatures and at this vibration level, there's no way that you can lose it unless a graduate student makes a mistake. So, <laughs> okay, so here's some of our machines. We've been using them to compare iron, copper, and heavy fermion superconductivity. We have visitors from all over the world. Uh, we would very much like to have a visitor from UAM to come and work with us. First thing I want to tell you about is how to use this thing to measure the momentum space electronic structure. So imagine an impurity atom embedded in an electron fluid, an incoming quantum wave, a de Broglie wave with this wave function and this wave vector, <coughs> hits the impurity atom and is reflected. Um, if the scattering is in the correct phase, then you can add these two wave functions together. And when you add these two wave functions and square, you get something which has twice the spatial um, um, the, the Q vector of this modulation. It has half the wavelength or twice the Q vector. Uh, so this interference pattern at each impurity atom has a standing wave surrounding it and that standing wave has a Q vector which is twice the K vector of the de Broglie wave that produced that interference pattern. So what you do is image these standing waves, take the Fourier transform, find the maximum in the Fourier transform, Q, and then associate that Q divided by 2 with the wave vector of the electron. And then if you do this as a function of energy, you can map K as a function of E for the delocalized electrons in the material. This is really cool and with apologies to any photo emission colleagues in the audience, it's better than photo emission for two reasons. One is we can see all the states above the chemical potential as easily as the states below. And secondly, we can do this experiment down at temperatures down to 10 millikelvin so we can get rid of KT from the spectral function. On the other hand, it's extremely expensive experiment, I can tell you that. <laughs> It's been very successful though. We've been able to use it mostly focused on strongly correlated electronic materials to look at a very wide variety of different phenomena um, and in different classes of correlated electron materials. And I'll be touching on three of those problems during this talk. Can you resolve the spin too? Say again? Can you resolve the spin too? Whether you can resolve the spin to like ah. So in our experiments, uh, we don't attempt to do so, uh, but there's very good evidence from the Wiesendanger group, for example, that you could resolve the spin, the momentum space structure of the spin. Uh, but I don't know anyone who's done it explicitly. All right, so first let's look at the copper-based uh, high TC and their mysterious so-called intertwined or coexisting phases. So here's a typical, here's the CuO2 plane, copper with two oxygens in each unit cell. Um, here's the um, electronic structure map I just showed you. Let me run that movie again. So when I first saw these movies, I was kind of disappointed. You know, they're not that vivid. They're not that impressive. It was very slow, expensive, and difficult, and risky, and painful, and terrifying to make the machine. So I, my wife is a physicist, and I sh showed her the first one of these movies, and I said, well, we're very proud of this, but we really don't know what to do with it. <laughs> So she had been working on MRI algorithms and she whispered in my ear, she said, take the Fourier transform, which is what this is. Well, the Fourier transform contains all the Q vectors of all the different interfering eigenstates in the system. It contains all the energy resolved momentum space information. It's actually a very powerful tool. So in that movie I just showed you, there are two pieces. And now this is specific to the cube rates. There's a high energy piece where very little happens. And there's a low energy piece where there's a set of energy dispersing wave vectors. Now we know exactly what the low energy piece is. It's the quasiparticles of the D-wave Cooper pairs in the system. They're in really excellent agreement with theory. These solid lines here are the theory and these data points are the data. So it's beautifully consistent with the signature of D-wave Cooper pairing. The high energy piece, which does not change with energy, actually appeared very mysterious to us in the beginning. 
these high energy states here um, are wave functions which do not evolve with energy and they have several broken symmetries which I'll show you right now. So each dot here is a bismuth atom and the symmetry of the bisco compound is such that the copper atom is underneath each bismuth atom. So here we go, if we image the high energy states they don't change with energy but you see they break translational and rotational symmetry the low energy states are changing with energy. They're de Broglie waves. They're dispersive. They're different at different energies. But here come the high energy states again. They're static. They break translational and rotational symmetry without very much long range order. We wanted to check that this is not some technical mistake of the tip or the surface or a bad graduate student or the software or anything. So we compare different cube rates um, at low carrier density where these phenomena are detected. So here's uh, oxychloride and here's bisco. And in terms of the breaking of translational and rotational symmetry, the electronic structure of these compounds, which are physically very different, are, is basically identical. So we're very sure that this is a global property of the cuprate uh, uh, parent underdoped compound. Now we can examine those symmetries. If we zoom in a little bit, we find that they're unidirectional lines of charge, which are called stripes. And those stripes are bond centered, so they're four unit cells wide, and they're centered on the oxygen atoms. So the symmetry line is on the oxygen atoms. So for the theorists, the fact that they're bond-centered stripes is very, very important. One thing it shows a priori is that the oxygen atom plays a key role in the cuprate electronic structure. Um, there's a whole family of theorists who do not believe that that's possible, but um, they're just contradicted by the empirical facts. And the other thing is there's another broken symmetry here which the really clever graduate students will now have about 60 seconds to discover, okay? Look at this image. I already showed you that it has translational and rotational broken symmetry in these stripes, but there's another broken symmetry here which it took me about seven years to find, so I only give you 60 seconds. <laughs> okay, so these stripey states, um, virtually every... Um, STM group in the world that studies the cuprates, all different compounds, reports these phenomena. It's a very, very robust phenomenon. And we have been reporting them for years now, for more than a decade. Many of our X-ray scattering colleagues, though, do not believe that any surface technique could, is a valid technique, I guess. But as time has gone on, more and more scattering experiments have also reported the same finite wave vector density wave broken symmetry in the underdoped cuprates, to the point now where it's very widely accepted. Okay, anyone know what the other broken symmetry is? Well, it says it here. If you look inside the unit cell, okay, there's a copper atom here, and there's oxygen, 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 oxygen. Or let me go up here and do it. So there's a copper atom here, oxygen, 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 oxygen. In terms of the image of the electronic structure, uh, the, ele the, unit, the, the unit cell should have had C4 symmetry. Geometrically, it has 90 degree rotational symmetry. But if you image the wave functions, it has 180 degree rotational symmetry, right? All of these objects are symmetric under 180 degree or C2 rotations. So there's another symmet broken symmetry here. It's a broken symmetry inside each COO2 unit cell. We already knew this around 2007, but there's a quantitative way of measuring it, which um, we finally figured out. You take the Fourier transform, you look at the two Bragg peaks. They contain the information about what's inside the unit cell. Then you take the ratio of the intensity of one Bragg peak to the other Bragg peak the ratio of the x Bragg peak to the y Bragg peak. If those two peaks are not equal, then rotational symmetry is broken inside the unit cell, trivially. We found that that's globally true in the underdoped cuprates and reported it in 2010. And furthermore, there's a very wide range of evidence that there is an Q equals zero, that means it's periodic with the crystal unit cell, intra-unit cell broken symmetry in the underdoped cuprates. And last but not least, we can use this Fourier transform STM and a model of the D-wave energy gap structure. We can predict each of the scattering interference wave vectors, extract 
where the Fermi surface was and what the shape of the gap is, and we come up with a nice nodal D-wave superconducting energy gap. Photo emission colleagues indeed found this at least a decade before we did. Okay, so here's your first homework problem. You need to remember this slide. This slide is a summary of the key things that we know about the cube rate electronic structure. Um, it has a dx squared minus y squared superconducting energy gap on a very simple Fermi surface, which is a single hole-like pocket around the pi pi point. Coexisting, it has a broken translational symmetry finite Q state, which is actually associated with this scattering process. And coexisting, it has a Q equal to zero broken uh, interunit cell broken symmetry state. So these three broken symmetries are the ones which have been discovered now in the last 10 or 15 years to represent the electronic structure of the underdoped cuprates. And as I showed you, this is not my personal opinion. There's a very wide range of uh, evidence in the literature from many different techniques that this statement, that this summary is correct. All right, now let's change gears to iron superconductivity, discovered in actually 06, but became prominent by 08. Phase diagrams of this compound have many common characteristics. The parent state is an antiferromagnet, but it's a metal, not an insulator. You can suppress the antiferromagnetism by shifting, by changing the carrier density. And as the antiferromagnetism goes to zero, the superconductivity appears. So we first uh, started working with Paul Canfield to study calcium-122, which I saw today is also being studied here quite beautifully at UAM. So we did our experiments in this doping range here in the parent state from which the superconductivity emerges. This compound has a beautiful surface. Up until this point, which was sometime in uh, 09, there had been many attempts to use spectroscopic STM to visualize the electronic structure of iron superconductors, but they really were pre prevented from having major scientific successes because the cleave surface, the surface which is revealed by breaking the crystal of most of those compounds, is disordered and charged and is a big mess. Paul Canfield, the genius that he is, proposed that because calcium is soft, you'll be able to break these crystals and get a nice surface, and he was exactly right. Okay, so we understand this surface very well, and on that surface, we were able to take the first wave function images um, of the nictide compounds. This, we did this in the middle of 2009, and we found that the states, the parent states, were very strange. The de Broglie waves are only dispersing along one direction here. And if I show you the Fourier transform, it's easier to see how strange they are. Here's the Fourier transform of that data. The wave vectors are all dispersing along one axis, but not along the other axis. The delocalized states are all propagating in one direction, but not in the other direction. We were also able to find that there's a lot of static electronic uh, disorder, which we recently demonstrated is coming primarily from the dopant atoms. Um, but it points in the opposite direction. It's rotated at 90 degrees to the direction of the delocalized states. I forgot to say, this dispersion here is certainly not consistent with a simple band structure theory for what we should observe. It tells us that something exotic and additional is happening. So uh, another thing we were able to do in these compounds is find a twin boundary. And that's very important. It allows us to examine the symmetry with more confidence. This is a crystal twin boundary under here. It doesn't look like it in this image, but if I show you the electronic structure images across that boundary, the nanoscale electronic disorder rotates by 90 degrees, and the dispersive quasiparticle interference signal rotates by 90 degrees across that boundary. Putting all these things together, um, in, by the end of 09, we reported that there is an electronic pneumatic phase in the parent state of the iron superconductors. And now, that doesn't seem like a very interesting or exciting statement because subsequent to this report, everyone in the world was able to determine that there is a pneumatic state in the, in the parent state of the iron superconductor. So how come we were lucky enough to get there first? It's because um, at the stage when these experiments were being done, these crystals 
were not detwinned. All the bulk crystals available in the world uh, were twinned. The two um, unidirectional orthorhombic domains existed in equal probability in the bulk crystals. So most of the bulk experiments didn't break any rotational symmetry because the crystals were twinned. But if you're looking at the atomic scale, the fact that you have twinning is not a problem. In fact, it's an advantage. Anyway, subsequently, these compounds were detwinned, and then it became perfectly clear that there is a pneumatic phase in the parent state. Now, a pneumatic phase is a phase that breaks rotational symmetry, but it does not break translational symmetry. It's not a striped phase. It's a Q equals zero phase breaking rotational but not translational symmetry. The other thing we can do is look at the superconducting energy gaps of this same class of compounds, and for this we used um, lithium iron arsenide, which it turns out to be a very useful material, has a very nice density, superconducting density of states, a very nice clean, flat, stable surface. On this surface, we were able to image the superconducting quasiparticles with atomic resolution. There's the image. This is the first movie ever made that we know of, of Bogolubov quasiparticles in an iron superconductor, and it looks like a mess. However, its Fourier transform looks quite beautiful. If you know what you're looking for, there are three bands here, and each of them is gapped. One, two, okay, one, two, three. We can process this scattering interference information. Uh, we have knowledge from photo emission and quantum oscillations of which band is which, and there are five bands in the first Brion zone of the iron superconductors. But from the quantum oscillation and uh, photo emission data, we're able to tell which band we're looking at. And from this data that I just showed you, and a model of how scattering interference would uh, produce different signatures um, at different bands for different uh, superconducting energy gaps, we're able to extract the momentum space structure of the superconducting energy gap, which is um, highly anisotropic. It's different in different directions of momentum space, but it's not nodal. In most of the iron superconductors, there's no node. There's a zero, theoretically, in the order parameter. It's along this line in momentum space. But the Fermi surface doesn't touch that line. And that turns out, we think, to have some very important consequences. OK, so here's your homework slide for the iron nictide superconductors. The Fermi surface is complicated. Here I show it reasonably simplified just into three bands, two hole-like and one electron-like. On this Fermi surface, you have this nice anisotropic but not nodal energy gap. It seems highly likely but not yet proven that there's a change in sign of the energy gap between this sheet and that sheet. We don't find any charge density wave in the style order parameter in the nictides, and neither has anybody else. There's no evidence for it. On the other hand, there's tremendous evidence that there is a pneumatic phase at Q equal to zero in this class of compounds. So I'd like you to remember these facts having to do with the nictides. The other thing I want to say, we'll come back to this, this dashed line here is where the magnetic Brion zone would be in the magnetic ordered phase. And it seems that whether or not the Fermi surface touches the magnetic Brion zone is very important to what happens. OK. Last class of phenomena I want to discuss is the heavy fermion superconductors and their intertwined phases. And uh, we, it was quite recently that we decided it is becoming necessary to understand the heavy fermion superconductors using the same technique and for the same purposes. Um, and the compound we wanted to look at is one of the most famous heavy fermions, cerium cobalt indium 5, with a TC of near 2.5 Kelvin at the doping where we're working. And I'll tell you a little bit more about its physics in a second. To know that it's possible to use spectroscopic STM to study heavy fermions, you can look in the literature and find out that it was achieved here at UAM a decade ago. <laughs> so we knew that it was physically possible to do this uh, by reading these beautiful papers. Um, so we decided to try and understand two things. The heavy band structure, how does it work? How and why does it work? 
and then the order parameter of the superconductivity exactly what it is. So here's the way you should think of a heavy fermion compound. It's a crystalline material with a lattice of almost localized F electrons, which are usually magnetic. So here I show them in antiferromagnetic. And then this somewhat magnetic or somewhat antiferromagnetic system is embedded in a fluid of fully delocalized C electrons. These are perfectly well de defined de Broglie states. So this is a complicated situation. You have two different classes of phenomena coexisting together. Local, localized antiferromagnetism and delocalized C electron states. Now, uh, what we're going to talk about is hybridization of these electrons with those electrons. And uh, here's what happens. Um, you have a light band of these delocalized electrons. These localized electrons have an almost flat band, or sometimes it's completely flat. And now if you introduce an interaction between them, you produce an avoided crossing and you get two new heavy bands. For those of you who like quantum mechanics, you can write a Hamiltonian for the C electrons, for the F electrons, and then you write a hybridization term which creates an F electron and destroys a C electron and the Hermitian conjugate. Then you can write this Hamiltonian in matrix form, like this. Now you're uh, describing a new eigenstate, which is going to be a linear combination of C and F electrons. Diagonalize. When you diagonalize, you'll find two new bands. We call them capital E of K, A and B. Here's one, and here's the other. And these two bands are made up of hybridization between the light C band and the heavy F band, which are embedded in here in the equation, plus the only other thing in here is the hybridization matrix element. In theory, of course, this picture has been available since the early 1970s, like 1974. But amazingly, it, people had not actually measured the existence of these bands by momentum space techniques over all those decades. And I'll tell you why. First of all, these bands this is 5 millivolts. This is 0 millivolts. So this band here, you know, above the chemical potential, it's maybe 1 millivolt wide. It's not like a regular solid state band, which is 10 volts wide. It's an extremely narrow band, which is only 1 or 2 millivolts wide. And similarly for this one. Um, most of this action is above the chemical potential, <laughs> which is challenging or impossible for photoemission. And furthermore, these things are so flat that means the um, momentum changes so rapidly with energy or the electrons are so massive that you need energy resolution in the 100 microvolt range or temperatures in the sub-Kelvin range to measure this band structure. And no techniques existed to do this for all those intervening decades from the mid-70s. So, again, following things which were pioneered here at UAM, we decided to use a dilution fridge STM but now for quasiparticle interference to measure the heavy bands. And I can tell you this is a challenging project. This took about 10 years. <laughs> uh, for the experts in the audience, this is a Kelvinox 400, but the insert up here was built to our design, not to the company's design. Okay, so scattering interference I already showed you from, uh, excuse me, from light electrons should do something like this. You're only changing the energy by a few millivolts here. So virtually nothing should happen. Very slowly changing wave vectors. On the other hand, if you have heavy fermion physics, you should expect huge effects. Because when you cross the chemical potential, the band structure suddenly jumps to a completely different wave vector. That's what we were looking for in the design of the experiment. The first material we looked at was actually uranium ruthenium 2 silicon 2. It's a modestly heavy fermion superconductor, which is good for exploration experiments because um, the band is not so flat that you can't follow it. It's just about right to detect it. So on those compounds, we were able, the surfaces are very beautiful. These sites here are thorium atoms substituted on the uranium site to produce the scattering that we need. And then on the surface of those compounds, we were able to image the heavy Fermi wave functions. And now you'll see the energy range of this image is only a few millivolts wide. But there's a great deal of activity in the wave functions. That's the heavy band. 
and now it's gone. And if I show you the Fourier transform, I can't tell you how happy we were to see this movie. It starts out at a large radius, it moves to a small radius, then it jumps back to a large radius, and then it moves to a small radius again. That's exactly what we were expecting to see. Heavy band structure, the uh, wave vector as a function of energy, should be something starting at a large radius, moving to a small radius, jump to a large radius, and move back to a small radius. These are the data from the movie I just showed you, and they are in excellent agreement with this theory. And in fact, this was the first time that heavy fermion wave functions were visualized directly. And that has opened a door very wide now. If you look in the literature, you'll see that there are dozens, if not hundreds, of people trying to do this now to study exotic heavy fermion compounds. OK, back to cerium, cobalt, indium-5. So we had to do this to learn how to look for the heavy bands, because they're the basis of the superconductivity. But now we went to cerium, cobalt, indium-5. It's antiferromagnetic in its parent state. It's got a high TC. And our job is to measure the heavy band structure and the, ga and the gap structure. They were both unknown. I forgot to say. Although the density of states as a function of energy, showing you what a heavy fermion superconductor uh, looks like, was measured quite a long time ago. In fact, uh, pioneering experiments done right here at UAM. The actual momentum space structure of the superconducting energy gap of a heavy fermion superconductor had never been measured for any heavy fermion superconductor. So here's what you got to do. You have to measure the light band. Then you have to measure the heavy bands. Finally, if the superconductivity appears where the heavy band crosses the chemical potential, a gap should appear in momentum space. So you have to measure three functions to understand how these materials work. And that produces a dynamic range challenge for the STM experimentalists in the audience. Think about this. You have to make a spectroscopic map, a Fourier transform map, hundreds of millivolts wide to get the light band then tens of millivolts wide to get the heavy band, and then a few hundred microvolts wide to get the superconducting energy gap. And ideally, you should do it in the same field of view with the same register. So it took a while to get this right. But in the end, we succeeded. These are um, wave function images and Fourier transform images for cerium cobalt indium 5. Very little happens because it's a light band, but there's the heavy band. It's just a couple of millivolts wide. Very little happens again because it's a very light band. You can use this information to track the light band in momentum space by following the features in that movie. And it's a whole like squarish band, and it actually ends a little bit above the chemical potential. So the next thing we could do is examine the part of this movie which changes very rapidly um, as a function of energy. So this is like uh, 4 millivolts down to minus 4 up to plus 10 millivolts. And that allowed us to see the light band turn into the heavy band, jump across the Brion zone, and turn back into the light band just as expected. And we could do that in a sequence of different directions in uh, reciprocal space and equivalently in momentum space. Oh, and for the experts, you see this feature here? This thing, OK? It looks like a third band has appeared when there only should be two bands. It isn't a third band. It's interband scattering, which appears when the two bands appear. And it was Dirk Moore who explained that to us. You should always expect this third feature to appear once the two heavy bands occur. OK, so now we have enough information here to uh, write down a Hamiltonian and parameterize a theoretical band structure and compare it with the observations. And we were able to report what the Fermi surface of cerium cobalt indium 5 looks like. It's got a one band closing around the middle of the Brion zone. That's called the beta band. And then it's got another more complicated band, which is star shape, actually, uh, it square shaped, cross shaped. Uh, around the pi pi point, this one here. And this data only became available earlier this year. So now we know the heavy band structure. That's enough information to help us search for the superconductivity. So here at last are the Bogolubov quasiparticle wave function images. And now the step size of these images is only a few tens of microvolts. But nevertheless, we have a complete map. 
taken at low temperatures. This map was really challenging to get all the data. But you can see the heavy bugaloo of quasiparticles here. An expert can see that this is a nodal superconductor. We figured that out instantly. Uh, we can tell because there's a whole bunch of scattering at zero energy with a particular symmetry. And from the details of this thing, all the details of this very rapid evolution now of momentum space structure of the Bogolubov quasiparticles, we were able to extract. Uh, first of all, we were able to measure the angle dependence of the energy gap directly in momentum <coughs> space. And secondly, we were able to extract actually the details of what cerium cobalt indium 5 energy gap structure looks like with precision in the 10 microvolt range and throughout momentum space. Um, some of the referees for this paper felt that no person could, that this was impossible. <laughs> but I guarantee you it's correct. <laughs> uh, last but not least, we're now pursuing down here not the superconductivity, but the other exotic phases which happened near the suppression of the antiferromagnetism and the appearance of the superconductivity. We're doing this right now. All right, <coughs> so here's your homework problem for uh, heavy fermion. They have a complicated band structure, but it actually does cross the Brion zone, which is interesting. I'm sorry, the magnetic Brion zone, which is interesting. We now know the gap structure, and we're beginning to learn something about the other broken symmetry states in these compounds. And we'd like to use this information in comparison with the information from the other materials to distill uh, some essence of this problem. That's the last thing I want to talk about. <laughs> Can one find a simple piece of solid state physics, not anti de Sitter space or black hole theory, or just regular solid state physics <laughs> um, of electrons and nuclei <laughs> in three dimensions, <laughs> um, where you can explain how does the antiferromagnetism um, get suppressed? When it is suppressed, why do these exotic ordered states appear, these intertwined phases? And which ones should appear in which class of compound? And then finally, when the intertwined phases are eventually suppressed, what should the form of the superconductivity be? And now there's some philosophy here which you might disagree with. We have received some fairly robust emails in response to our paper on this subject, strongly disagreeing with our philosophy. But our philosophy is that there should be a single simple explanation. Come on in. No, okay. There should be, it, we should not, it's not botany. We're not searching for a dozen different explanations, one different explanation for each compound. There should be a single simple explanation for everything. That's the objective. That really should be the objective of physicists, I think. All right, let's look at the facts. It's said that these phase diagrams are similar. Antiferromagnetism is destroyed, but the parent is an insulator here. Here's the superconductor. Antiferromagnetism is destroyed. This is a metallic state. Antiferromagnetism is destroyed. This is a metallic state. In all of them, you have this famous dome of superconductivity. So in that sense, in some empirical sense, they look similar. But if you look at the Fermi surfaces, these are very, very different materials. Really different. One has a nice hole-like Fermi surface. Another one has between three and five Fermi surfaces, some hole-like and some electron-like. Heavy fermion Fermi surfaces are themselves very complicated beasts. Cerium cobalt indium 5 has at least two. So in terms of the Fermi surfaces, they look like very different problems. Importantly, we have found that where the antiferromagnetic Brion zone, that's the Brion zone that would exist if the material was a stable antiferromagnet, where that Brion zone touches the Fermi surface has a huge impact on which of the intertwined phases appear. The reason why there's no charge density wave in the nictides is because the antiferromagnetic Brion zone does not touch the Fermi surface. Um, you can, you can, um, you can look at the superconducting energy gaps for these three classes 
And this will tell you why we're so interested and so excited in this problem right now. It's only in 2012 that these became available. It's only in 2013 that these became available. The opportunity to make these direct comparisons <coughs> has not been sitting there for decades. It's only actually been there for a few months. We know a great deal about the details of these different gap structures, and they are very different. So it looks kind of challenging to find a simple theory which would produce these very different exotic superconducting states, all from the same theory. Furthermore, the exotic non-superconducting phases are quite different in the different compounds. This one breaks translational rotational symmetry. This one is a Q equals zero state. We're not quite sure what this one is yet. So working with my longtime friend and colleague, Dong Hai Li, we spent much of the summer just doing compare and contrast. We see this in one compound, we see that in another compound. We see A, and it's almost Aristotelian logic, right? If A is B and if B is C, then A is C. We were trying to do it at that <coughs> level, right? Figure out what is the simplest explanation for this thing. And we stuck our knock out, uh, necks out, specifically Dong Hai, because it's his theory, <laughs> um, explaining how magnetic interactions and the intertwined electronic orders and the superconductivity could be related to each other in a very simple theory. Here's the theory. It's got two terms in the Hamiltonian. This is like an undergraduate Hamiltonian. This term here is the delocalized electrons. There's their energy. And there's C dagger C, summed over spin and momentum for regions near the Fermi surface. That is like the Hamiltonian of any well-defined piece of metal. The specific thing is that we know the exact geometry of the Fermi surface. It isn't a model Hamiltonian. It's an exact Hamiltonian because we know the geometry of the Fermi surface. The second term in the Hamiltonian is on-site antiferromagnetism. If you put an electron at one site, and if you bring a test electron up to a nearby site, what does it feel in terms of the magnetism? So if, if your original electron is spin up, anti, on-site antiferromagnetism would produce spin down at four nearby sites, spin up at four second nearby sites, and so on. And you can parameterize that by a number, the exchange energy, you can call it, or the magnetic energy and SI dot SJ, where that's the spin on each side. That's a really simple Hamiltonian. <coughs> now you take these two pieces of information, Fermi surface and the strength of the magnetism, which comes from another source, usually neutron scattering, and you write them as a Hamiltonian in momentum space, um, taking the details of this um, magnetic interaction to be correct for the copper-based, the iron-based, and the heavy fermion superconductors. So this is not a model Hamiltonian for the magnetism. It's the known magnetism in these compounds. Then there's a process you can do um, where you can decouple this equation here for all the different order parameters which would be produced by this Hamiltonian. You can find out which superconducting order parameter will exist, which charge density wave order parameter will exist, which pneumatic order parameter will exist. It's a very well-defined theoretical idea, which has existed for decades. So Deng Hai carried out that calculation to figure out what are the different order parameters of every type coming from this quantitative Hamiltonian. And so he figured out the superconducting, the uh, pneumatic, and the charge density wave order parameters for each of these types of compounds. OK, so here are the distinct Fermi surfaces, and here's the Hamiltonian. It looks the same, but it's actually different for each of them because the details of the Fermi surface are different in each case. <coughs> the details of the magnetism are different in each case. From this Hamiltonian, one can predict immediately the symmetry of the dominant superconducting order parameters, which should exist in these classes of compounds. They're only coming from the Fermi surface geometry and the magnetism. Those are the predictions. They're in excellent agreement with the three classes of energy gaps, which have been discovered for these three classes of compounds. Really excellent agreement. Furthermore, and I'm coming to the end of the talk now, so don't panic. <laughs> Furthermore, the impact of these uh, zone crossings uh, can be used to predict which density wave orders should exist in each compound. 
one would predict that a charge density wave with this scattering wave vector should exist in the cube rates, and that's exactly what exists in the cube rates. One should exist that no charge density wave exists in the nictides because the antiferromagnetic Brion zone does not cross the Fermi surface. And we're not quite sure there should be a weak charge density wave in the, uh, in the heavy fermions. Finally, one can predict the Q equals zero are pneumatic phases, which should come from the same Hamiltonian. So one would predict for the cube rates that there's a broken C2 symmetry <laughs> electronic structure, for the nictides that there's a C2 uh, pneumatic electronic structure, and similarly uh, one for the heavy fermions like this. And two of those phases, the ones for the cube rates and the nictides, are very well known to exist. Okay? so. In summary, you can take this Hamiltonian with a direct knowledge of the Fermi surface and the antiferromagnetism, and you can capture all of the known phases of these three families of compounds. Um, and that, the credit for that achievement should go to Dong Hai Li. Um, the people who have been responding to this paper have been challenging us, well, if you know so much about correlated superconductivity, you should predict some new high TC superconductors, and then we'll believe that you're correct. And that's a fair challenge. And with that, thank you very much. All right. Thank you very much for this beautiful account of Correlated electrons. So, questions or comments? Can you say anything with this the may convey the order of Uranu and Newton into silicon two? Say that again, please. If you can say anything about the hidden order of uranium and Oh my gosh! Wow, that's a different question. Uh, using this technique, you would predict that it's a pneumatic phase. No, I see the technique with the measurement, not with the idea. Ah. So, yeah, because you have yeah. the so in, in our study, uh, we were not able to find any broken symmetry associated with the hidden order in our data sets. Um, whereas there are a number of colleagues now who are reporting that there's a very tenuous pneumatic phase there, which only moves the nuclei by a few parts in 10 to the 6. So maybe there's a very subtle pneumatic phase, but we were not able to observe it. Of the system. Ah, thank you very much. It's critical that it be two-dimensional. If we let a three-dimensional band structure go into these calculations, we wouldn't get the superconductivity in any of these cases. Very good question. Yes, yeah. In the case of the heavy fermion, yeah. we plot the dispersion of the gap. Yeah. It seems to me that there was a discontinuity. Ah, of brilliant. <laughs> This is a very serious audience. <laughs> this guy. What that is, is at the point where the Fermi, Fermi surface here can be nested with the Fermi surface there by a wave vector pi pi, there's a sudden jump in the gap. Almost certainly there's a giant self-energy at that location due to the electron-electron interaction. Brilliant question. Say again? That occurs only in the, in the heavy fermions. <coughs> so we have searched for the same thing in the cube rates, and we don't find it at optimal doping. Um, and there are no other heavy fermions where this experiment has been done yet. So if you call me back in a few months, we will know whether or not this type of thing is more universal. But right now, it's too soon to be sure. Yes? Superconductors, there are some compounds that they don't have magnetism, and there is some other that they have a peculiar magnetism that is not common order. So, how? Okay, so that's a very fair and general question. So, um, let's go back out here. This is. Um, So we have pursued this approach for some other materials where we know that the magnetism in the parent state is antiferromagnetic, okay? And we get plausible, meaningful results. 
I challenged Deng Hai, in a very friendly way, to pursue the same scheme for compounds where there's ferromagnetism in the parent state. And he tells me that it will be done, but that the coding problem is different because sums in momentum space for ferromagnetism have to span all of momentum space. Ferromagnetism is at q equal to zero. So the numerical challenge is different to solve that problem. But if he accepts my challenge, he, he will be able to produce predictions for materials whose parent state is ferromagnetic as well as antiferromagnetic. Ah, great question. These guys are so serious. <laughs> so we have made some elementary tests that as we shift the chemical potential, which is the primary thing that doping does, that the outcome of these calculations would alter in a reasonable way. But we haven't had enough time to complete a, a, a whole phase diagram using this technique. As soon as we complete a whole phase diagram, hopefully you can read the paper when it comes out. But that's a great question. It's the next logical thing that should be done using this approach, which would be to span a whole phase diagram by moving the chemical potential through the band structure and see what happens. When you show this, this opening of the gap, the, the masses were negative, right? So we're whole, whole kind of... Uh, Say again? Yeah. When you show the opening of, of the gap of the two yeah. ends of the light and filter, yeah. there were negative masses there. Okay? So, ah, great question. Great question. Let's go back here. These are hole like bands. Uh, when we measure, this band actually didn't cross the chemical potential in, in uh, uranium ruthenium 2 silicon 2, as far as we could tell, although just barely it might reach it. <coughs> this hole like band has a positive effective mass and the effective mass we measured by measuring 1 over d2e dk squared is in very good agreement um, with the thermodynamic effective mass for this compound. Yeah. With the one which you get from specific heat Pardon? The one which you get from specific heat. Yeah. Electronic specific heat gives M star is about 28. Well, when you measure electronic specific heat, you don't get a sign. You just get a number, OK? Uh, when we take the angular dependence of the crossing slope here, 1 over d2 e dk squared, we got 25. <coughs> Yeah. You say that the other parameter should change time. Yes. Uh, uh, but you don't have a method, a way to, 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 to say that out of the method. Okay, great question. <laughs> okay. Um, so, one of my former postdocs, Tetsuo Hanaguri, who's now a group leader at Riken in Tokyo, invented a way of doing the Fourier transform STM in the presence of magnetic field and using that to determine the sign of the order parameter. And he already demonstrated that in the iron selenides, the order parameter changes sign using that technique. No one has succeeded in doing that yet in the iron nictides, but I hope to get there within a very short time. And I was telling Herman this morning, we have succeeded with that same experiment for the cerium cobalt indium 5, and we see the sign change in the order parameter. So the, How? pardon? How? We'd have to write some Green's functions to answer that question. But, well, the bottom line is that scattering of Bogolubov quasiparticles by a potential which violates time reversal changes the intensity of scattering of states which are going from regions of the same sign compared to scattering which are going to regions of different sign. So you can write down a model for that. If you see those relative intensities, you have a priori knowledge that there's a sign change in the order parameter which we now know to be true for cerium cobalt indium 5. Can't you, you think of a more direct way through a superconducting people? Well, you know, we would think that the Dale Van Harlingen experiment should work for this compound. I don't know why it hasn't been done. But for the nictides, you have a horrible problem because the sign change is only in momentum space. In real space, any given direction is associated with both signs. Thank you very much.